gathered together from the cosmic reaches of the universe, here in this great hall of justice, are the most powerful forces of good ever assembled. There are titles in every medium that have stood the test of time, and will always be enjoyable regardless of their age. You have movies like Seven Samurai and Yojimbo, or video games like The Legend of Zelda and Chrono Trigger. These titles will always be praised by their proponents as timeless masterpieces. The word most often associated with titles like these is the word classic. Himitsu Sentai Go Ranger is not one of these titles. It is an interesting show though, and it was certainly good for its time. Note that I said for its time. Go Ranger hasn't aged well, and watching it for more than a few episodes will make it fairly apparent as to why. Most of the modern mainstays of Super Sentai aren't present in Go Ranger. There are no giant mecha in the show. Instead, the team has the Very Bloon, an airship equipped with tools like claws and missiles that are used for rescue missions. And in true Super Sentai fashion, it gets blown up halfway through the series and replaced by a faster, stronger airship called the Very Dream. They also don't have any transformation trinkets that future seasons do. All they do is yell GO! And they transform, usually while jumping up or spinning around. The only visual element that is constant among the five Go Rangers is their belt buckles, which serves as the Go Rangers emblem and the key they use to enter their secret base. They also have motorcycles that are upgraded mid-season with cooler versions, and jetpacks they use to fly around instead of being able to leap tall buildings in a single bound like future Sentai teams. Go Ranger starts with the genocidal Black Cross Army attacking the Japanese military organization Eagle at each of their five major bases. But they apparently aren't very thorough or just complete idiots, because at each of the bases they attack there's a single survivor. Kenji Asuka from Kansai, Peggy Matsuyama from Hokkaido, Daita Oiwa from Kyushu, Akira Shinmei from Tohoku, and Tsuyoshi Kaijo from Kanto. Actually, now that I think about it, maybe they just didn't think there could be someone who could take multiple machine gun woods to the chest and still survive. I mean, look at that! How's that even possible? How can you even walk after that? He's not even a Go Ranger yet, and he's already basically Captain America. Anyway, the Black Cross Army is led by the Black Cross Fuhrer. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Look at that! What does that remind you of? He wears a pointy white hood with a white robe, he holds the position of Fuhrer, and he wants to commit genocide. Are you kidding me? Look at him! They're not even being subtle about it. Now I'm not saying that this guy is alien Hitler, but this guy is alien Hitler. All he's missing is a little dictator stash. Uncanny. The Black Cross Fuhrer employs different generals and field agents that all have different masks with various powers. Their foot soldiers are called Zoldars, who are basically humans that are brainwashed into serving as their shock troops. And they also bribe and blackmail various other humans to work for them as scientists or saboteurs. Attempts to escape or failure results in execution. I'm guessing their employment package doesn't include a 401k or workman's comp. It's amazing that they can replenish their numbers at all when they just kill anybody who so much as gets a whiff of failure. They're like the extreme version of High Expectations Asian Dad. His name is Black Cross Fuhrer, not Black Cross Failure! Stupid ape! You die now! Okay, okay, so the villains are already at dumpster fire. Fortunately, our heroes fare better. Uh, kind of. Meet Akarenja, Tsuyoshi Kaijo. Aorenja, Akira Shinmei. Kirenja, Daita Oiwa. Momorenja, Peki Matsuyama. Midorenja, Kenji Asuka. Together, they are the Go Rangers. The only thing standing between the Black Cross Army and the destruction of humanity. Gonpachi Edogawa is their commander, while pretending to be a harmless chef at the restaurant Snack Gong that's a cover for their secret base. At first he just barks orders at them from behind a computer, but a few episodes in he shows up in person and introduces his bodyguards and secret agents, Yoko Kato 007, Tomoko Hayashi 008, and Haruko Nakamura 009. As Aka Ranger, Tsuyoshi is the leader of the Go Ranger team, and he's everything a leader should be. He's strong, smart, brave, and in control. His older brother was killed in the same attack that Tsuyoshi survived, and it serves as a driving force for Tsuyoshi. 
He's the only one on the team who suffered such a personal loss at the hands of the Black Cross Army. Unfortunately, while it would have been an excellent avenue for character development, it's not really mentioned more than a handful of times over the course of the entire series. Tsuyoshi uses the Red Butte, a whip that has incredible versatility. It can transform into a spear, a drill, a net, and he can channel a live current through it to shock enemies that have been ensnared. He also has a tranquilizer gun that he can use to disable enemies, but Tsuyoshi favors the Red Butte by far. Akira serves as the second in command of the Go Ranger team. He's not really meant to serve a purpose other than just being the cool hotshot to contrast with Tsuyoshi's straightforward, strong, and quiet leader. He's an ace pilot and a crack shot, and uses the bow Blue Cherry, later upgraded to the Ultra Blue Cherry. His piloting skills are so good he's even captured and brainwashed in one episode to pilot for the enemy forces, though of course he's able to shake off their brainwashing. Now let me ask you a question. If you found curry rice just lying around while you're searching for a monster, would you sit down and just start eating it? If you said no, congratulations, you're not fit to be Key Ranger. Daita is good at three things, engineering, fighting, and eating. He's an engineer, so he may be quite book smart, but he's not particularly bright if that makes any sense. He constantly falls into traps because of his love for curry, and he's always confounded by the riddles of Yoko's younger brother, Taro. He wields the key sticker, a staff that has three attachments based on rock, paper, scissors, and a remote control that jams machinery and radio waves called the YTC. Daita also serves as the comic relief of the team, as he has the worst luck imaginable and is always the one getting into unfortunate situations even during fights. Midway through the season, he's temporarily replaced by Daigoro Kumano, who's the first example of a sixth ranger in the series, albeit one that stands in for an already existing ranger. Daigoro is basically just Daita without a hat. Daita practices judo while Daigoro is a sumo wrestler. Daita loves curry, and Daigoro has an insatiable hunger for spaghetti. Considering Daita's sudden departure and return, it's readily apparent that Daigoro is just a temporary stand-in for Daita, necessitated by real-life circumstances. Behind the scenes, Baku Hatakeyama wanted to participate in a play, and the writing team wrote his character out of the show temporarily, so that he could pursue that opportunity while saying Daita was away on assignment. Daigoro does have one notable quality to his character though. He is the first character in a Sentai show to be killed in action. In his focus episode, Daigoro is responsible for a mishap that ends up causing incredibly potent weapons to fall into the hands of the Black Cross Army, with disastrous consequences if used against the Go Rangers. After some encouragement from Taro, he regains his confidence and decides to fight the Black Cross Army to reclaim the weapon, but he gets impaled for his trouble. As he dies, the Go Rangers promise to continue fighting the Black Cross Army and gives him a hero's burial. Daita conveniently returns to active duty with the Go Rangers as Key Ranger again, and stays on until the end of the series, while Daigoro is never mentioned again. Peggy Matsuyama is the only female Go Ranger, and while many shows of the era would portray a woman as a damsel in distress, she is anything but. She's very proficient in fighting, and while her weapons are feminine, underestimating them would be a huge mistake, since she is a brilliant chemist who also serves as the Go Ranger's explosives expert. You'd look at the earrings on her helmet and think they're just there for decoration since she's the only female ranger. But in fact, they are powerful explosives that she throws with incredible accuracy. She also uses the Momo Mirror, which is used to blind enemies and reflect flames, and the Momo Karj, which she throws like shuriken. Kenji Asuka is the youngest member of the Go Ranger team. At 17, he's brash and hot-headed, and will often run off half-cocked. But he's an expert with his boomerang, which he later upgrades to be able to split into multiple smaller ones to outsmart enemies. He's clearly the character children are supposed to identify with, and he gets focus episodes where he proves that he's just as hardy and worthy of being a Go Ranger, despite only surviving the Black Cross's army's initial attack due to a freak coincidence. The Go Rangers are supported by Edogawa and his secret agents, and they're hardly pushovers themselves. They're very skilled in the martial arts and only really get into trouble when one of the actual monsters gets his hands on them. Even when Edogawa is captured, he's able to endure torture at the hands of the Black Cross Army. A few episodes after their introduction though, both Tomoko and Haruko just stop showing up. They're not killed nor do they retire, they just vanish without explanation. And only Yoko continues to appear. Probably because her younger brother, Taro, is a constant fixture and snack gone, 
and is constantly kidnapped by the Black Cross Army to be used as leverage against Yoko or the Go Rangers. Seriously, at some point you'd think they just learned to stick the kid in a padlock room so that they can't be blackmailed by the Black Cross Army anymore, but what do I know? The Go Ranger costumes are interesting. But this was before the show's used spandex, so the suits aren't as flashy. You have the colored jumpsuit, a cape, and a helmet. Akaranja, as the leader, stands out the most. Originally, Go Ranger was supposed to be a show that revolved around a character named Red One, the precursor to Akaranja, and be centralized around him, while the other characters filled a more supporting role. The final product makes the Go Rangers more of an ensemble cast, but you can see a bit of the mindset of the original thought process behind the suit design. Akarinja's visor is a different color, and he has an eagle crest on his helmet that surrounds his rank number. His collar is higher, and the chest pieces on his suit are yellow as opposed to the other Go Rangers being red. You could argue that making his red would have made the chest pieces too hard to distinguish against his suit, but it's interesting that they went with that color scheme instead of making them all uniformly black or white. I honestly like the Go Ranger suits. The suits are eye-catching, and the color and capes add some extra flair to the design without overcomplicating it. The helmets are also visually interesting and iconic. And the only real complaint I have are that the visors bulge out, which is a bit off-putting aesthetically. The music really just reflects the sensibilities of the times. It's basically 70s show tunes in Japanese. And if you've listened to 70s show tunes, you'd know why it's not something to comment on in depth, because it's just there to make sure that the scenes without dialogue aren't just silent. It's not bad, it's just nothing that's remarkable or memorable, and it really only serves as nostalgia for an era gone by more than anything else. So by now you're probably thinking, it just sounds like a pretty mediocre Sentai season. Well, this is where things start to kind of fall apart. I say kind of, because everything still holds together but just barely, and with copious amounts of narrative duct tape. If I could describe the story of Go Ranger in one word, it would be inconsistent. The Black Cross Army wants to destroy all of humanity for some reason. It's not really made clear. They're aliens that want to kill all humans and rise from the ashes to populate the planet themselves, but that doesn't make much sense either because their plans range from weird to downright insane. In one episode, they threaten a busload of random children just because they can. And in another, they just start planning to assassinate some random ambassador who came back to see his daughter just because they could. Then, in yet another episode, they hijack a disintegrator beam that can turn anything it shoots into dust and plan on transforming Earth into a desert wasteland, which probably would have made it uninhabitable for them too. Their plans can involve anything from being petty jerks to genocidal maniacs. They are just all over the place. It just seems that their plans revolve around kill as many humans as possible while causing as much suffering as possible without any thought going into either the fallout or the overall efficiency of their plans. I know I'm thinking too hard about a 70s TV show meant for children, but what do they gain from burning down all of humanity if it means that they'll get caught in the flames themselves? This is Evil Overlord 101 stuff here. Part of this problem is due to the series' length. Go Ranger is the longest Super Sentai season at a whopping 84 episodes. That's 30 episodes more than the average Sentai season, and 50 episodes more than its follow-up season, Jaka. Anyone who watches Super Sentai shows knows that there's going to be a lot of Monster of the Week type filler episodes in every season. But Go Ranger is nothing but filler. And lasting for over 80 episodes with that really makes it a hard sell. I can count on one hand the number of episodes where something important happens. You could probably watch about 10 or so episodes that have the major plot points and have a complete understanding of the entire season. There's only so many times I can watch a series where every episode is some variation of THE BLACK CROSS ARMY FOUND A WAY TO TURN ALL HUMANS INTO FURRIES! STOP THEM BEFORE THEY TURN THE ENTIRETY OF JAPAN INTO YIFKON, GO RANGERS! in between what appear to be random references to the Benny Hill show. I'm not even joking, check this out. <laughs> not only that, but there are a lot of episodes where the civilians the Go Rangers have to save have all the self-preservation instinct of a lemming that's hopped up on LSD. 
I know I'm supposed to suspend disbelief while I'm watching the show, but if you were running away from a monster with a pink telephone for a head, why would you even entertain the notion of calling for help with the conspicuously placed oversized pink telephone? Can you say, Darwin Award? It's not helped by the fact that the show uses serious prop recycling due to budget reasons. The reason every monster is called a mask is because a lot of the monsters use similar or identical bodysuits with different masks, like TV mask and baseball mask. In the case of Tiger Mask and Steel Tiger Mask, they're just blatant reuses of the exact same suit with a slightly different mask, treated as two separate monsters. That's not a new monster! That's like if you ate a pizza, threw it up, ate your vomit, and declared that that means you ate two pizzas. You didn't, and you're disgusting. On top of that, the special effects are also laughably bad. I know that I'm judging by modern standards, but the effects have aged so poorly that suspension of disbelief can no longer be maintained to any reasonable degree. <laughs> That's not to say all the episodes are duds though. There are quite a few episodes that develop the characters in interesting ways, such as the episode where Tsuyoshi shows clemency towards Sung Halo Mask due to his pleas for mercy, only to be betrayed. The fact that his kindness was taken advantage of sends Tsuyoshi into a fury, and it really shows in the way Tsuyoshi emotes and how his fighting becomes more brutal and violent afterwards. As the series wore on, the show would have episodes featuring the other Go Rangers in character-centric storylines, that developed them in similarly compelling ways. Kenji gets a focus episode where he's framed for murder by a childhood friend and court-martialed, and he has to go on the run to find out why his friend would betray him. Kenji's able to track his friend down only to watch him get murdered and beg his forgiveness before dying. Peggy also gets a focus episode where an old flame returns from the dead to rekindle their relationship, only for her to find out that he was working for the Black Cross Army all along to assassinate a high-profile target that was under the Go Ranger's protection, at which point Peggy is forced to shoot him and watch him die a second time. Smaller, more personal stories like this really add to the character's personality by focusing on their humanity and making them more relatable. Of course, it wouldn't be possible to pull off stories like these without the actors doing a fine job of portraying the emotions necessary, and just because they're in a children's show doesn't mean they just dial their performances in. Later on in the season, it seems that the showrunners got more funding for the show, so they were able to make more interesting monster designs that didn't begin and end at the mask and were more visually distinct. However, most of the problems with the show's writing remained, which makes most of the series a slog to get through. A lot of people who watch Super Sentai stress the importance of the first battle of each season, as that battle sets the tone for the entire rest of the season. I would agree with one key difference. The final battle is also equally, if not more important, since it's the climax of the hero's struggle and what the entire season leads up to, the culmination of all our heroes' efforts and battles. Go Ranger's final episode, while appropriately ending with the destruction of the Black Cross Fuhrer and his fortress, is given only slightly more weight and fanfare as all the episodes preceding it, ending with the Black Cross Fuhrer being destroyed because his fortress was so full of weapons, it was just a giant powder keg waiting for the Go Rangers to ram it with their combined vehicles and blowing it out of the sky. It's not the worst ending, but it's certainly not the most memorable either. I'm sure that in 1977, this was a very satisfying conclusion, but looking at it objectively, it's a bit of an anticlimax. So, is Go Rangers worth your time? Uh, I'd say probably not. 84 episodes is a lot of time to devote to a series that's average at best, even one as prolific as the starting point for the entire Super Sentai franchise. Not counting the opening and ending, that's 20 minutes per episode, making the entire series 28 hours long. There are a few good episodes, even a few great ones, but all you really need to watch are a handful of specific episodes for a solid beginning, middle, and end to the storyline. That said, Go Ranger was popular enough to warrant a second series being greenlit, and the writers and showrunners tried to distinguish it from Go Ranger by trying their hand at writing a more narratively complex story, a decision which would end in utter disaster. Join me next time, and I'll tell you all about Jaka Dengik Tai.
So what do you think about Go Ranger? Have you watched it? Do you agree with me or disagree with me? Be sure to leave a comment with your thoughts on the series. And again, if you like what I'm doing here, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. And if you think I deserve it, share it with your friends. The Super Sentai Overview is a video series by the fans for the fans. We appreciate any and all support that our viewers give us. As always, I'll see you next time. Abayo!